Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder, and we are here with another edition of the Daniel and Revelation uh, Bible study series. And today we're on Revelation chapter five. Today we are on Revelation chapter five. I'm asking if you're on the line today to please make sure you have your Bible handy. Make sure you have a pen and pad handy. And definitely we want you to pray, right? There's no way that we can cover or mm -hmm. hope to cover this information without God being here with us. Okay, so we're going to pray this morning as we get started. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you give us wisdom and grace. Hide us behind the cross. We surrender this Bible study to you, Father. We are not capable or able to do it in and of ourselves. We know that we need you, Father. So please be with us. Give us wisdom in your holy son, Yahshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for being with us, and thank you for, for taking the commitment to go through the Bible with us, and uh, today we're on Revelation chapter 5. We're on Revelation chapter 5, and the, the caption for today's Bible study is, He's worthy. He's worthy. In, Revela in Revelation chapter 5, we are going to run into God, the Father, holding a book. The book is sealed with seven seals. And the question that is asked in all of the universe is, who is worthy to open the book? And no one is found who is worthy to open the book. John, who is having the vision about the book, he begins to cry because he knows everything is on the line with whatever is in this book. It's all on the line. Hmm. What is in the book is the question you should be asking. What is in the book? So in this book is a key piece of evidence, a, evidence, a piece of evidence that is necessary for your case and mine. You know, we've been talking for the last few days that we've got a court case going on. And it started in, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 22. There's a court case going on. And we are able to peek into God's throne room. He's sitting at his bench. And so far yesterday in Revelation 4, we saw God on his throne. And we saw the jury. So those of you who have ever been in any sort of legal situation, you know that there are other elements of this case that are missing. So today we run into a couple more pieces of this court case as things proceed. But this is a court case where everything is on the line for all of us. And as these prophecies unfold in the book of Revelation, we will see where we stand in man's history in this court case. We will see messages, we will see warnings, and all of these are found in the word of God. So I want you guys to, to pay attention as we move forward. Now, where are we in the book of Revelation? Where are we so far in the book of Revelation? We covered John on the island of Patmos having the vision that this is Christ in his glory. He has a vision. Chapter two and three were the seven churches, which represented uh, each church on a mail route going through Turkey, but it also represents the seven epochs of time of God's church from the time Christ was crucified, the early church, the apostolic church, all the way to the time he returns. In chapter four, we went over a vision of God's throne, and here we are in chapter five. We have a book that has seven seals. And it is ultimately opened by a slain lamb. It is ultimately opened by a slain lamb. This is the courtroom. And in this courtroom, we have the judge, right? The Bible says that God is judge of all the earth. We find that in Genesis 18, 25. We saw the courtroom scene in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 22. In Hebrews 12, 1, the Bible says we have a great cloud of witnesses. 
And the Bible goes through all of the great heroes of the Bible. So these are witnesses that, that Christ will call one after another to present their case. We've talked about the jury, the 24 elders. We find them in Revelation 4, verses 4 and 5. The 24 elders come 12 from Old Testament, 12 from the New Testament. Christ takes them back up with him. They also serve as ministers uh, with him along because uh, he is our priest. They serve as uh, part of his ministerial uh, team. We also have our defense attorney. We need a good uh, defense attorney. I heard somebody say one day there was a court case and they said, you need to call on JC. And they said, who do you mean, Johnny Cochran? They said, no, Jesus Christ, right? So we have the greatest defense attorney ever. And we find him in 1 John 2, 1. It says, we have an advocate with the father. Then we have the prosecutor. And 1 Peter 5, 8, the prosecutor is our adversary, the devil. Mm. Who's sitting in the, in the gallery watching all of this go on? According to the Bible, the angels and the sons of God. We find that in Job 1.6 and 1 Corinthians 6.3, they are spectators. You know, the Bible says that we will ultimately judge angels. So angels are watching the case. And in Job, we see sons of God who many believe are representatives of other unfallen worlds. So we got our defendant. Who's the defendant? That's us, mankind, sons of Adam. When our great grandpappy Adam fell, we were already in trouble. We are now born in sin, shaped in iniquity. What is the crime? The crime is sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is the sentence? According to Romans 6.23, the sentence is death. The wages of sin is death. Let me tell you, in this courtroom, everything is on the line. Everything mm. has got to be right. Every I dotted, every T cross. We already talked about who the judge is. Now, this is really important, the, the defense attorney. This is a royal courtroom. The, the judge is also a king. Not anyone can come into the king's presence to present a case. They have to have, they have to come from a royal background. So the advocate has to be royal. And the Bible says that he is the prince, right? So he has, he has royal background. He's able to come into the presence of the king to present his case. But he has also got to have some heart. The Bible says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is going to be no, no mamby pamby case. He is the Lamb of God, which is important because he's got to be able to have some sympathy with the jury. He's got to be relatable to the jury. Remember, the jury were, were redeemed. They were redeemed from the earth. So he is sympathetic with them. He has some sort of, he can vie with them. He can understand what they went through. He is the second Adam, which means that he has a stake in it as well. And he is an advocate. On the other side of the table is the prosecutor who we've already said is also a lion. Our, um, we, uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that we have an adversary of the devil. He is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So if you got a lion on the other side, you want a strong attorney too. So we got two lions going at it, two lions. One is the lion of the tribe of Judah and the other one is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we got two lions and presumably this is going to be a rough case. So we don't want no kittens coming to the table. Mm. The Bible says that his name is Satan and he is a deceiver of the brethren. He is the father of lies, right? Unfortunately, liars and lawyers, they, they, they say that the terms are interchangeable, but this one here, he is the father of lies on the other side. He's going to use every trick in the book. He is also the ruler of this world. He used to be Lucifer in heaven until he fell. So he has the bona fides to come before the king. He's been before the king before. He knows royal protocol. The courtroom is the throne room. When does the trial date begin? Pastor Morell explained, us, explained it to us in no uncertain terms in Daniel, 12, uh, Daniel 8, 14. It says after 2,300 days that the sanctuary will be cleansed. The, the cleansing that it has to be cleansed of is sin. There's blood in the sanctuary. 
So there is a period of atonement that goes on where everybody is investigated based on the, the schedule of things that the Bible has given us. That period began sometime around 1844. That is also the same time period that the Laodicean church begins, which is the last church age that we covered in Revelation 3. It mm. too began in 1844. The name of the Laodicean church means people judged. Mm. So that is the beginning of the court date. The beginning of all of these records for all of the people who came from before the flood back, back to Adam, their books are being re, um being reviewed, as well as those of us who are currently living up until the time that sentencing occurs. Where does sentencing occur? The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 12, that all of us will stand before the throne room of God, small and great alike. So this is the background that we're coming in. And now that we've seen the jury in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, we will see the evidence begin to be presented, and we will see our defense attorney make his case. He's going to present his bona fides. He's going to show you why he is eligible to be your attorney, right? He's going to show it. Amen. All right, so let's jump into the Bible. We've used a little time. I had to give you some background so you can kind of be engaged where we are in today's episode. Revelation 5.1. And I saw in the hand of him that sat on a throne a book written and on the backside sealed with the seven seals. Note, a wax seal was used to secure and authenticate important documents. Pastor Morell, is there anything you want to add at this stage? Uh, yes, I want to talk about this uh, book, this book that is in uh, the right hand of him who sits on the throne. So we know him who sits on the throne is God the Father, introduced to us in chapter one, we see him further. We saw him clearly yesterday in chapter four, but now we see that he sits on the throne and he has a book in his right hand. Let's notice a few details about the book. It's written within and on the backside, implying that whatever is in this book, it is filled up. There is no more space to be written in this book. We've come to the end of a matter, right? Uh, 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 all the the, the empty space where some writing could be done has been filled up in the book. And also notice how completely the book is sealed. So what you have to ask is what in the world are we looking at? Is God just holding a, 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 a random book in his hand? Was God just reading a novel and happened to be holding on to it? Was God just holding the latest edition of his uh, a, a, a subscription to the heavenly times you know what book is in this hand god the father is not just going to have any book in his hand it's a very very important book now to give you a little background um psalm 89 and verse 14 tells us justice and righteousness are the foundation of your throne we know that god's government is established on justice and that was symbolized in the old testament sanctuary by having the Ten Commandments placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant, okay? The Ten Commandments were placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant. That was the foundation of God's throne. But when they actually placed the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, there was another book that was placed on the side of the Ark, okay? Did I make that clear? The Ten Commandments, the foundation of God's throne, his law, were inside of the ark, but there was another book that was placed on the side of the ark. This was the book known as the book of the covenant. And what we are seeing here, brothers and sisters, is the heavenly original of that book of the covenant. Uh, allow me to read to you a scripture that tells us about the importance of this book. And you tell me as I read it, and again, write this reference down, tell me if you hear any similarities to what we've seen in Revelation chapter four, what we see right now and what I'm reading. Uh, this is Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, I'm gonna start at verse 24. Deuteronomy 31, verse 24, the Bible says, when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were completed, then Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord saying, take this book of the law and put it inside I'm sorry, and put it 
uh, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. So it may be there for a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Even now, while I am yet alive with you today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? And what does he say next after he says, put this book on the side of the ark? He says, gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers so that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And disaster will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. So what we see here is God is holding in his hand the book of the covenant. And one of the key things that was recorded in the book of the covenant is God had preempted the rebellion of his people. God had preempted that his people would fall away. And so he called the elders to witness this scene so that, so that it will be clear that he was not just falsely charging his people. And that's the book we see. And I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, the book is sealed with seven seals. What is the importance of the number seven? The importance of the number seven is that it's perfect or complete, saying that, saying that this case that is being leveled against the peace of people of God has been sealed. Is case closed. And that's going to help you as we go forward to understand why would John see this book and immediately start crying? It's because God has a case against his people, unfortunately, that, that, that they would rebel against him in spite of all his love for, for them. And that the case is not even really up for discussion. It's not really open. The book is sealed with seven seals. The case is closed. Amen. All right, let's move on to verse 2, Revelation 5, 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was mm. able to open the book, neither to look thereon. This is important. Not any angel is proclaiming. A strong angel is proclaiming. If you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, there is an angel who's crying out as God is coming into his throne room. And the Bible says that as the angel is uh, crying out, holy, 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 he says even the pillars in heaven are shaking, mm. right? This means this is super important. Who is worthy to open the book? He's asking, who, is, who has the moral standing? Who is qualified to open the book, right? Because this is going out to the whole world. He says, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth. This is a universal sort of um, uh, call. So anybody in the whole universe, is there anybody out there who is able to open this book? Anybody who's qualified to be an advocate for this fallen race on man's behalf? Adam failed as our representative. He was, he was created in the image and likeness of God. And so we need somebody else now to advocate our case. We need somebody else. And here's the question that is being asked. Pastor Burrell? Yes. Uh, 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 let me say something. You know, all of heaven is interested. They see the case of humanity and they want to know, is there anybody that's going to take this case? Is there anybody who can argue who can fight this case? And we know in John chapter 5 and verse 22, and I've, I've referenced this, but just to remind us, it says the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Uh, here we are in Revelation uh, chapter 5, verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look upon. So the person who is speaking here now is John, the revelator. He's weeping and he's in a constant state of weeping. He's mm. already crying because he knows what is at stake, that there's nobody out there who can open the book. Verse five, and one of the elders said unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open and loose the seven seals thereof. Mm. So while John is speaking, one of the elders says, hold on, hold up, wait a minute. 
And he says, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. What is important is the tribe of Judah was the tribe that, that was declared in prophecy that would bring forth the Messiah. So this is the pedigree that the Messiah is coming from of the 12 tribes, and he is the root of David. That means that David was the greatest king in all of Israel's history, but it says even before David was the Messiah. So it is showing that he is literally the son of God. That is showing his royalty. Mm. Uh, Christ was also called the branch. So he was called an offshoot of David. It means that he came before David and he came afterward. But in this particular sense, the elder is pointing to his beforeness, his, his divinity with regard to his ability to come and stand and open this book. Pastor Burrell. Mm. And, and notice, notice, brothers and sisters, this clear parallel that's being drawn for us. If you remember back to the churches, right? Church number six, Philadelphia, Christ was said to have the key of David. All right. He had the key of David so he could open the door and no man could shut it. All right. Now Christ is being introduced here as the root of David. All right, because there's a book that was shut that no man could open. And so now he's the only one that can open it. So 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 the uh, the angel in giving the prophecy is drawing clear parallels for us to clearly see that this is Christ and he's the only one who can commit judgment. He's the only one. Think about it brothers and sisters, how merciful God is. Christ has walked a mile in our shoes. Hebrews 4, 15, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. So he's able to judge us with mercy because he knows the fierce struggle against temptation and sin, but he also knows what it means to be the sinless conqueror, perfectly victorious in every phase of his life. And we can all say hallelujah and amen to that. Amen. One more thing that I think is important when he says that he's the root of David. If we look at Isaiah 11:10, and it says, mm. in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David, as we know, based on Matthew 1, 6, which shall stand for an ensign of the people to it shall the Gentiles seek and the rest shall be glorious. So it's saying a couple of things that Christ comes before David, but it also says that he was going to extend this gospel to the Gentiles. When we are starting in this uh, revelation and talking about the seven churches, the seven churches are not in Israel. They're not in Jerusalem. They're in Turkey. Turkey is considered the, 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 um, the center of the Gentile nations. All of these nations are, are centered in this Turkey area, and they're able to spread out and reach all of the Gentile people. This was something that the Jerusalem, the Israelites of old had a hard time dealing with. They thought that they were God's favorite nation, and they were, but they were supposed to go out and deliver this gospel. And he said, because you have not delivered the gospel, you thought that, that it was just for you. You even slayed mm. the son of God when he comes to you. He says, now I'm going to send this gospel to the rest of the world. And in fact, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, Christ says that he will come back at the end of the age of the Gentiles. Lastly, why does he say that he is the root? The root of a plant gives the plant its life, its substance, and its strength. Mm. You can see a, a plant looking okay on the top, but if its root is bad, it's just a matter of time. If the root is strong, even a dead plant above, above the surface will eventually grow back. So he says, I am the root. I, I sustain my church. I sustain my people. And it is a strong symbol for all of us to recognize that when we are having issues, we've got to go back and deal with the root. Okay? Verse hmm. six, verse six, Revelation five, six. And it says, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Pastor Burrell. Oh, yes, yes. Brothers and sisters, let's pay attention to what we see here and how we see Christ. Okay, Christ is in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders. Now, we've mentioned several times that the, the, the most clear parallel to this in Scripture that we see is Daniel chapter 7, where it says that the Son of Man was brought before the Ancient of Days. 
it says the judgment was set and the books were open. Notice the clear parallel. We have the lamb coming to stand before the father. Okay, he's going to receive and open the book. Now let's talk about uh, the lamb. Notice that he stood, he's standing as it had been slain, meaning that this lamb bore the scars of a sacrifice, but it's still alive. This is a clear reference to the death and resurrection of Christ. Everything you see here is pointing forward to Christ's ability and authority to be the judge. Why is it that he can be the judge? He says, uh, because he's the one that died, yea, rose again. He's the one that's installed to stand as high priest and mediator. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Remember back in the day, brothers and sisters, this is too rich. Back in John chapter two, when Christ had to cleanse his temple from money changers, they were committing bribery and extortion in the church. And he came through with a whip of seven cords and drove them all out. He says, he says, my father's house should be called a house of prayer uh, for all nations, but you've turned into a den of thieves, right? Christ had to come through and cleanse his temple. He had to come through and cleanse his sanctuary. And, and, and the scribes and the Pharisees were angry and said, by what authority do you do this? He said, you destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it back up. And this he said, referring to his death. He says, the authority I have to judge, the authority I have to cleanse my sanctuary is that even though you're going to put me to death, I'll be raised back again after the third day. And so you see Christ here judging, cleansing his sanctuary. And why does he do it? Because he's the lamb who stands as having been slain. Amen. He's the one who died, yea, rather is risen again. And notice he has seven horns and seven eyes, a symbol which the Bible uh, interprets with, with uh, uh, all clarity of language. It says the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So this is Christ exalted as high priest, and he, ha and he has sent his spirit, right? Ephesians chapter 4 says that when Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men, referring to the Holy Spirit. Okay, and John chapter 14 through 16 records in great detail the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Christ told his followers, it is to your advantage that I go away so that I can send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth unto you. And so we see uh, seven eyes or sorry seven horns a clear symbol of all power all power seven eyes a clear symbol of all wisdom or all knowing so it's saying that christ is the judge because he died he is risen he has all power so christ can fairly judge because there is no sin in our life that christ does not have sufficient power through his holy spirit to give us to overcome so his judgment is fair he's not holding us guilty for things that we are helpless over okay and also he's all knowing he knows the situation completely hence the seven eyes he sees completely into all things and now we see this is why christ has the authority and has been exalted as the judge of all the earth thank you pastor Burrell. there's a couple of other points i wanted to bring up on this lamb you know john is weeping a verse ago he's weeping mm. and the elder says don't worry and he talks about a lion coming who is of the tribe of Judah. And so if I'm John, the mm. next thing I should see is a lion show up. Mm. But what he sees showing up is a lamb. And the, the way the, the text is written, when the lamb shows up, it is actually bleeding at the time. It says stood as a lamb as it had been slain, meaning that this lamb, when he shows up, is bleating, bleeding and suffering when John sees him. Remember I told you about the pit bull yesterday? I told you that if it's, if it's your pit bull, it's mm. as gentle as a lamb. But if, if somebody else comes into your house, Mercy. your pit bull is now a lion. And so we get to see the two different sort of aspects of Christ to protect his people, to stand for them, to be their advocate, he is a lion to show that he understands what we went through and to come and to bear our sins, the strength that he shows is different than the strength that we in, a, in, in, in the world see, human see. You know, mm. humans see strength as muscle, as might, as political power, as financial power. Nope. 
In God's world, power represents submission, submission, humbleness. And so he comes as a lamb and he's bleeding. The, his bona fides is his blood. It is mm. his blood. It is the fact that he has bled that shows that he is worthy, right? So we see another aspect of him. I love the fact Pastor Burrell talked about his seven eyes. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, the eyes of the Lord go throughout the whole world. So he is able to take a look at everything going on from the beginning of time to now nothing misses, misses him. And then mm. he says, which are the seven spirits of God. Remember we had talked about in verse, verse one, uh, um, Revelation chapter one, that, these, that the spirits of God represents God's presence among his church. That is God the Father's presence in every single church we see him, right? Because we said in Psalms 139 verse seven, David says, where should I go from your spirit? Where should I go from your presence? So here we find his son, also in the presence of all of his churches. He is there. He says, my father is there and I am here. And he lays down his bona fides and he shows up right there in front of his father's throne. And the fact that he is worthy, it's the blood. Let me tell you, there's nothing more powerful than this blood. This is the only thing that can take away our sins is this blood. And that was the really important part of the atonement process that went on in that sanctuary. So we've seen it play out again and again, and again. All right, verse seven. And it says, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. He comes, he takes the book mm. out of the father, out of the father's right hand. Remember I told you, your right hand is your strong hand. Amen. But it's also the hand that represents fidelity. It is the hand that represents trust. It is the hand that represents authority. The Bible says that no man can snatch it out of God's hand. Right. Nobody yeah. can take it out of God's hand. So when he comes and he takes the book out of God, God's hands, his father's hands, his father recognizes that he is worthy. Mm. It is proof positive that his sacrifice was accepted. You know, Christ wanted to know, is, is my sacrifice, is my death on the cross, is it accepted to cover all of man's sins for all eternity if they are willing to accept my blood? Pastor Burrell? I mean, what you see here is that Jesus is pleading to have our case reopened, right? Remember the book was sealed with seven seals, completely shut, case closed. Our, it, it, one sin, one sin is enough to disqualify all of us, any of us from heaven. So, so God sitting down to judge does not have to search long and hard to find a reason to keep us out of heaven. That's easy. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Case closed, but now crisis is coming as the advocate, as the defense attorney, appealing to have our case reopened and retried. And now, this time when the case is reopened and retried, it's like the only reason the case can be opened and retried is, is when there is new evidence that comes to light, a new, a new witness. And so it's like, well, 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 what, is, what, what is the new evidence? The new evidence is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the new evidence that pleads very strongly in our behalf. Uh, maybe uh, some of you have seen a movie called Just Mercy. Just Mercy. It tells the story of a lawyer named Brian Stevenson, graduated from Harvard. And instead of going and getting a high powered law job, making lots of money, he went and uh, founded a not for profit a program called the Equal Justice Initiative. And he committed his life. To, to defending people who had been wrongly tried and convicted, people like uh, who had gotten on death row wrongly. And, and, and that movie chronicles the specific case of one man, Walter McMillan, who had been wrongly convicted to a, a life sentence that was on death row. But this man was released because Brian Stevenson, the, the advocate came and had his case reopened and retried. That's what Jesus is doing for us. He reopens the case, he retries it and says, look, here's the evidence that argues in their favor. My blood, my blood, my blood. Amen. Amen. So here we are, Revelation 5, verse 8. And it says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four elders fall down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of of the saints. So when we see now these four beasts and, and the 24 elders are responding 
to the fact that the father has given, given Christ uh, this sealed book, right? He's able to take it out of his hands and he's going to be able to open it, that he is worthy. They are responding to it. They recognize what is at stake. And it says that they have a, uh, every one of them has, has a harp. Everyone has a harp. They're about to join in a celebration that is about to occur. And, and when we get to heaven, all of us are going to be able to sing. I'm not able to sing now. I got to wait till I get to heaven. And it, it seems as though that this, this harp is representative of their ability to, to give praise and to give worship. So this harp, all of us will have it. We won't have limited function. And then it says, and the golden vials full of odors. The Bible says that when we pray, our prayers are like sweet aroma in God's nostrils. So these elders also, like I said earlier, are participating in a ministerial function in God's court. A ministerial function. Yes, they're, they're part of the jury, but they also have a day job where mm. they participate as ministers in God's court. Right? Pastor Burrell, anything else before we move forward? No, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. All right. Verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. And out of every kindred and tongue and mm. people and nation and has made us our and made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Now they are starting a new song. Now, when the Bible says a new song, it is suggesting that there is a new experience, something mm -hmm. that has never happened before, which is requiring people out of a new experience to proclaim a different kind of praise. Mm -hmm. not, not, a, not necessarily a higher praise, but a praise that is unique because of a certain circumstance. It may, it may be considered a more elevated praise because they got more to praise him for. You know, if, if I, got a, I got a bad tooth and I, I get my tooth fixed, I'm going to give a praise. But if you got stage four cancer and you are redeemed from stage four cancer, you're going to give a different kind of praise than mine, a more elevated praise. And so here they are. They are singing a new song. We see in the Bible some other examples of people giving a new song. Mm. In Exodus chapter 15, when the children of Israel were released from Egypt, the Bible says that they sang a new song. It was called the Song of Moses, the Song of Moses. You find it in, in Exodus 15. What is so important about the Song of Moses? This Song of Moses talks about the children of, of God are surrounded on every side. They're surrounded by mountains on both sides. And in front of them is the Red Sea. Behind them is Pharaoh, and there is no way for them to get out. There's no escape. You have, ever, have you ever been in just an impossible situation where there's no escape, no way out, no way that, that you can figure out how to resolve this situation? That is what the children of Israel find themselves in. The Bible suggests that when we come to a group called 144,000, right? We're coming to them soon. These people are, are the true witnesses for Christ in the last days. They are gonna be in the same exact situation surrounded on every side by the enemies of God. And the Bible says that they will overcome by the blood of the lamb. Mm. They too will have a new song, a song that is unique, an experience that no one else has ever had, they will be able to sing. In fact, before we finish today's Bible study, I'm going to give you some of the words of the song. It's in here. The beginning two verses of the song are here. And we pick up the latter portion of the song in Revelation chapter 15. You are going to be able to know the song before you get to heaven. How about that? I'm going to give you Amen. the beginning of the song, and then you'll pick up some more. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, there'll be some additional verses, some new experiences that will be added on to our song. Pastor Burrell? Brothers and sisters, I just hope you're getting this this morning. I hope you're getting into this. I want you to see we are condemned. Case was closed uh, our death sentence, the execution date has been set. There's no hope. But then we had an advocate stand for uh, up for us. And, and, and he gave us some legal counsel. Remember Revelation 3? 
I counsel thee, his legal counsel was you need gold tried in the fire of faith that's been refined through trials. You need white clothes. You need righteousness, not just covering the past, but also converting the character and the conduct. You need eyesight. You need the Holy Spirit to really see your situation for what it truly is. He gave us that counsel. And guess what? If, if we have repented and confessed and forsaken our sins, all that old evidence that condemns us all of a sudden in a new trial, it's inadmissible now right? We've overcome the accusations of Satan. And, and now the evidence that stands for us is the blood of the lamb, the righteousness, the purity, the perfection of Christ. And just as Brother Felder said, we overcome by the blood of the lamb. That means heaven, heaven enlists us, enrolls us in its rehabilitation program, specifically for the purpose of rehabilitating ex-convicts like you and me. We call that uh, uh, in the gospel sanctification. That's how we actually grow into the men and women that Christ has called us to be by his spirit and by his grace. I just hope you're seeing this right now. That's why John was weeping loudly because the case was closed. But now you go from loud weeping to exultant shouting and rejoicing, not just by John, but by every creature in heaven and every creature on earth, all coming together to praise Christ the risen, the slain and risen lamb, just like it said in Daniel 7, all dominion was given to him. His kingdom was an everlasting dominion. We see the perfect fulfillment of this in our very eyes in the book of Revelation. Awesome. Awesome. That's some good stuff, man. You sure do a great job of making it visual. One thing I want to bring out in verse 10, and it says, and he has made us God, uh, he has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You know, so often we are looking forward to going to heaven and I am looking forward because he says, where I go, you shall, uh, you, you will come also. And he says, my father prepared a place for me, a uh, pl place for you and, and, and where I am, you shall be also. So we get a chance to go to heaven, but also we find out later on that heaven actually comes back down to earth. Heaven comes down. There's a song we used to sing, heaven came down and glory fills my soul. So anyway, literally heaven comes back down in the book of Revelation, and it settles on the top of Mount Olives. But it says the last the last part of the sentence, and says, we shall reign on earth. I mean, I know my address here now on earth, but when we come back down, we'll actually be back here. We'll be back here on earth. It's just something Amen. to think about, man. Something to, to think about, that ultimately we end up back here on earth, but it is an earth made new. Not an earth with sin and crime and debauchery and all of those kind of things. and pollution and dirty water, et cetera. It mm, is an earth. Mercy. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking Hallelujah. To that. So Pastor Burrell says that the song breaks out and a lot of people join in. Verse 11, and it says, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round mm. about the throne and the beast and the elders. Remember, a song has just broken out. They have pulled out their harps. They are singing praises to God. The four elders are singing, the angels have joined in, and John says that it is a loud, a loud sound that they're making, loud voices that they're using. And it says, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Wow. Now, if you just go 10,000 times 10,000, you're already at 100 million. Mm. And then you add a thousand on top of that, it becomes some other number, and then Another thousand on top of that, you reach a number that is that is uh, the highest number that has a name in in our English vocabulary, and you hit the 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 number that is called a Google. How about that? How about that for the devil having an invitation for everything in the Bible? A Google of angels Mercy. are now singing. This is a loud voice and. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you exactly what they're singing. But the host of heaven join in and acclaiming the worthiness of the Lamb. This song of praise swells out in all of space and time. And it ends in a grand climax when every knee on earth and mm. under the earth, those are people who are under the powers of evil, shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they confess glory to God the Father. And then there are voices of many angels around the throne. You remember one angel was able to shake a pillar in heaven. What is it when every single angel and all of the, the beasts and the elders all cry out in unison? 
I mean, this is, they are on beat. We could all, we could all sing together, but we can't all talk together. So if they're all going in harmony, they are all singing together. Pastor Burrell? Brothers and sisters, do we really consider the, 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 the practicality of this scene? You know, the Bible talks about the angels. They are God's servants, his ministers, and they specifically minister to us who are going to become heirs of salvation, right? And, and we see them praising God with this vibrant rejoicing. And, and I wonder sometimes, you know, the Bible talks about how the angels, when they serve God, they do it without deviation, they follow him promptly. They follow him quickly. They obey him exactly. And I wonder if it's because they've seen this scene. They know where the story ends. They see all the heavenly hosts joining together to worship the creator and to worship the lamb. And so that gives them the impetus to do everything that God says when he says it, just as he said it, because they know where the story ends. When you and I are fighting, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Do we consider that this is the Lord of hosts? These are the heavenly hosts, the heavenly armies that are commissioned to stand at our back to overcome the forces of the evil one. Do we remember that this is where the story ends if we are faithful to Christ? I believe that's what will give us a greater strength, a greater impetus to say yes to God and to go fiercely into battle, even against the strongest of our own weaknesses, the strongest allurements to evil, the most pressuring temptations to deviate from God's will to the right or to the left. Here we see that God himself has commissioned this mighty army to fight for us, and we see where the story ends up. Let's make sure we end up on the right side of the story, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. So here we have it. A, 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 un, a untold number of angels are now singing together. An untold number. John says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. But mm. really he's just saying that because it's a numberless. He can't, he can't count them. It's, it's too many to count. But here it is. These are the words of the song. You want to know what they're about to sing? Here it is. It says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessings. Mm. This is a sevenfold doxology. It's sevenfold. He's, he's telling you in every area of power he's got to cover. Because true power is not just riches or wisdom. What good is it to have riches and wisdom and have no strength? Or have riches, riches and wisdom and strength and have no honor? What is, good is it to have riches and wisdom and strength and honor and have no glory? What is it mm. to have riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and not able to give a blessing to somebody else? So he's saying in every area that you can consider power and mm. might and authority, he's got it covered. This is very similar and when you look at the, the song that Moses sang in, in um, Exodus chapter 15, you got to look at it because in this, in this song that he sings in, in Exodus chapter 15, Moses declares how great God is, how he dethroned Egypt and got rid of the horse and the rider. Do you know um, in the Bible, there are many miracles, but God considers saving the Israelites from Egypt to be his greatest miracle. It is referred to over and over again throughout the Bible as an example of God's great power. It is used as the, the penultimate example of God's great power. But when he <laughs> redeems us, fallen man, from circumstances that we thought, how do we get here and how do we get out? That will become the new song. That will become the new sort of anthem that the world sings out about how he brought us over. And we're going to get to another, uh, one more verse we're going to get to of the song here. And then we're going to pick up another verse when we get to Revelation 15. So you, maybe that's a song that you guys can put together. There are people who have tried to put it together in the internet and you can actually play it. But they, they, this is the song that we'll be singing, that we give him the praise that is due. Pastor Morell? Brothers and sisters, this is just another call saying, give everything to Christ. 
whatever power you have, it belongs to Christ. Whatever influence that is, whatever riches, material resources, it belongs to Christ. Wisdom, whatever knowledge God has given you, it belongs to Christ. Strength, your physical abilities belong to Christ. Your honor, your position, your status, glory, whatever looks good or shines about you, that belongs to Christ and all your blessings. Whatever anybody else does for you to help you, to benefit you, that belongs to Christ. And that's what it means to worship. That's just, this is the definition of worship is when you give all these things that you receive from God, when you simply give them back to Christ to whom they rightfully belong. Amen. Amen. One last thing on this song. They're going to sing this 144,000 that we're going to come to that are redeemed. They're going to sing the old song and the new song. The Bible says that they're going to sing the song of Moses, the old experience, and they're going to sing the song of the lamb. The lamb. Amen. Both songs. Here we are in verse 13. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the sun and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. So who is he that sits on the throne? That is the father. And who is it? That, that is in front of him and it is now sort of being proclaimed and exalted. That is the lamb, which is Christ, the Messiah. And the Bible says that the father is going to give him his own throne. So right now he is sitting on a throne with his father, but the father said that he will give him a throne. And Christ says that I will cause you to come and sit on my throne with me. And I will ultimately give you your own throne. Pastor, mm. anything else before we go on to the last verse? No, you can go on. You can go on ahead, brother. Awesome. And it says here, and the four B said, amen. Amen says, I agree. We are in agreement. Everything that you said, I co-sign on it. The four B's come back at the end of the day and they say, amen. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worship him that liveth forever and ever. So listen, we're going we're gonna to pivot and take some questions, but I just want to give you a, a quick peek at what's coming uh, for tomorrow uh, just a little taste so you can prepare as we go into the four horses of, of the apocalypse, the four horses of the apocalypse. We're going to start tomorrow on the seven seals. We're going to start mm. on the seven seals. And those seven seals is part of the case that Christ is going to present to his father as to why at the end of the day, everybody who calls on his name and believes in him and does what he says do should be saved. All right. Yeah. So let's Amen. look at it. We're just going to give you a sneak peek at tomorrow. Tomorrow hmm. we're going to be looking at the four horsemen, the four horsemen. And when we look at these um, four horsemen, it's going to go over the seven epochs of time. Remember the seven epochs of time for those churches? Remember the churches? Hmm. Remember the churches? They had seven periods of time in the churches. We had Ephesus, AD 31 to AD 800. And it meant the first or desirable. We had Smyrna from AD 100 to 313. It meant sweet, sweet smelling. Pergamos 313 to 538. These were different epochs of time. Guess what? When we get to the seals, it's going to cover the identical time periods. And we're going to see what is going on in Christ's church. We're going to see what is happening to them, how he responds. This is all of the evidence that he's presenting before his father of what is going on with his church and his people and those who have chosen uh, the God of this world, all of that is presented. So I started to put these charts up on my Facebook page so you can download them or do whatever else you want to do with them. Uh, but these are the time periods, right? The 538 to 1798 called Thyatira. Uh, and we have, um, this is the age with, that the papacy was the strongest right? 538 to 1798. The Bible says that before Christ returns, that Rome will re receive her power again. She will be as strong as she ever was. We have Sardis, hmm. Philadelphia, uh, 1833 to 1844. And we have Laodicea from 1844 till the end of time. If you look at the chart that I have here for you, for the seven seals, look at the time periods, right? AD 31 to AD 100. That is the white horse where the church is the strongest. We have uh, the second seal, which is the red horse. From AD 100 to 313 or thereabouts, we have the church being persecuted, bloodshed going on. We got the black horse coming. 
uh, the same time periods. And we'll get into this in detail. I just want to tell you that none of this is a mystery. People have made Revelation a mystery, but it's, it's easy when you line up these various epochs, you can see these things that will occur tomorrow. We'll, we'll go back into a lot of history again, unfortunately. We'll go back into a lot of history, so definitely have a pen and pad available as we do that. And we're going to be happy to go through these different seals um, as we start tomorrow. And we're going to see this lamb. He's going to break off these seals one at a time. So at the end of the day, his case can be presented to his father. All of his evidence will be submitted to mm. his father. Pastor Burrell, are there any comments in the thread um, that you want to bring out before we um, close? Yeah, Sister Kathleen says, some people can't get anyone to take their case, but I'm so grateful to have Jesus as my advocate and Elohim as my judge. Sister Shara responded, praise the Lord, he has never lost a case. And Sister Sandra responded, yes, Sister Kathleen, thank God Jesus refuses no case. And I just wanted to read, somebody needs to claim this promise today. And today is your day to claim this promise. John 6 and verse 37, all that the Father giveth me, shall come to me and him that cometh to me i will in no wise i will not for any reason cast out you just have to come do you hear do you hear the father's voice he's drawing you to look upon his son jesus place your case in his hands he's the only one worthy to argue in your behalf let him do that so sister kathleen brought that out and brothers and sisters that's the promise and the warning is the warning is if we don't wake up and realize our condition of wretchedness, poor, blind, and naked. Christ says he's going to vomit us out. And what that means in the court system is, is Christ is saying, look, if you don't come to me, if you don't place everything in my hands, then I have to refuse your case. You see, the reason that Christ has never lost a case is he always wins the cases he takes. Now, the question is, is he going to have to refuse our cases if we're not giving ourselves to him? That's not his desire. Let's place ourselves in his hands where he can fully take our case. And when he argues our case, we know there is no chance of defeat. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we close out, I want to remind you that uh, we're doing our uh, cover to cover Bible challenge. We just want you to read the Bible cover to cover, right? So we have a couple of different reading plans for you. Uh, we've given out quite a few in the last week or so, well over a hundred um, so definitely, if you want to copy of the reading plan, it's just you reading the Bible cover to cover. And it just shows you a way to read it 15 to 30 minutes a day to get from Genesis to Revelation. We want you to be able to read the Bible for yourself. Test everything. Test everything mm. we talk about on this call. We, we want Amen. you to pray about it, read it, et cetera. And also, we want you to share it with 10 other people. Find 10 other people, your friends, your family, your frenemies, people from the church, the pastor, whoever, and say, hey, listen, I want you to take this challenge to read the Bible cover to cover. We want to see if we could get 30,000 people to read the Bible for themselves. The reason we read the Bible is because it gives us instruction. It gives us wisdom. It helps us build a relationship with him. And it is also the only sword, the only offensive weapon that we have against the devil. So please take the challenge. I'm going to give you my um, cell number. Just text me and say that I want to take the the um, C to C or cover to cover Bible challenge. And uh, again, you don't have to get on with us. You, you don't have to get any commentary. I don't want you to get any commentary. Just read it. Just read it and, and work your way through from Genesis to Revelation. I don't care how long you've been in the church or what your denomination is. Just read it for yourself and ask God to make the words of this Bible clear to you. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Somebody please put my number on the Zoom, put it in the Facebook, and if somebody can also place it on the YouTube page, I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you want any of any of the Bible studies that we've done, you can put that in the text. I'll send you the whole list of all of the Bible studies in case you want to send the videos to anybody else. With that being said, everybody, uh, we're just going to do our final prayer, and we're going to close out. Pastor Burrell, if you could just bless us with the final prayer. Brothers and sisters, let us pray before our God and our King, Father in heaven. Lord, I see why you taught us to pray the way that you did, because sometimes all we can say is, hallowed be thy name. Your name is worthy of all reverence, all honor, all praise. Lord, may it be truly reverenced in our lives the way it ought. May our, reflect, our lives be a proper reflection of the glory of your name. 
And may we not be found as those taking your name in vain. Father, help us to remember that you have exalted your word above all your name. So that if we truly want to hollow your name, we have to live in this word. And by your grace, this word has to live inside of us. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the living word. Lord, I don't, I don't know what to say except thank you that Jesus took our case. Thank you that you appointed him as the judge who will judge the earth in righteousness. Not just meaning that he will condemn and ultimately destroy the wicked. No, also meaning that he will judge and restore our lives through his righteousness. Give us that faith that is unto salvation. Give us that repentance that is unto life, Heavenly Father. I'm praying for somebody who wants to know him, who doesn't feel they can know him, who feels they have failed too greatly. They have separated themselves too farly. Father, if you would send your spirit to them right now to convict them, yes, convict them of their sin, but just as quickly as you convict them of their sin, convict them of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and convict them that because of Christ's doing and Christ dying, Satan has been cast down and we need not remain a moment longer in the kingdom of darkness. This is my prayer this morning, Heavenly Father. Bless us. Bless us with the blessing for what you sent Christ, that he would be the one turning us away from all of our iniquities. Lord, we thank you. Lord, grant us that we will end up on the right side of this praise and worship service at the end of all things. Grant us to be those saints who are praying right now, whose prayers are even being held in the very hands of the 24 elders and given to Christ, but who presents them perfectly. Lord, I just, I just say thank you. I say thank you. But Lord, may it not just be a verbal praise. Don't let us fall into the sin of the Pharisees, honoring you with our lips while our hearts, our hearts are far from you. Lord, give us the, the, the praise of an obedient life. Give us the thanksgiving of, of a willingness and a diligence to do what you have said, when you have said it, just the way you said, do it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen, and amen again. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today as we have covered um, Revelation chapter 5. Tomorrow we start on the Revelation 6, which are the seven seals. So definitely come back. Read your Bible in advance. You know where we're going, so read so you can follow along. Uh, I, th I do thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Thomas Feld. On behalf of myself, Pastor Anthony Burrell, Cordell Dormer, who has put so much time and effort into these slides, as well as my uh, wonderful wife, Melody, who is helping me in so many ways doing this Bible study, as well as with Cover to Cover. I am just so grateful for all of them. Uh, nobody can do this Bible study on their own. Mm. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit any one of us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? So until mm. I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's Bible Amen. is officially over. Elohim bless everybody. Till tomorrow.